Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 12th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mo mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is the decision on whether to take Agenda Item 4 in private. Is everyone content that Agenda Item 4 is taken in private? Highly uh, content to take uh, Agenda Item 4 in private. Uh, given the seriousness of one of the matters being discussed, I would have thought it merited its own agenda item. Uh, and on the basis of the facts we already know, I would request that if the committee doesn't reach a consensus today, that in the interest of full transparency, we return to the discussion in public session at our next meeting so that all members can formally put their views on the record. Uh, Mr Mandel, you've already put your views on public record. Uh, I think that... Uh this should go ahead in private, as is the normal practice. Does anybody else have an issue with that? Can I just say that I, I do think if we don't get satisfaction in the private session, session, there is an issue that we has to be discussed. If, if we're going to be dealing with something in the private session, then discussions for it should be taking place in the private session and decisions should then be made at that point. Can I just clarify, however, that we're not deciding not to discuss this issue in public at some point in the future? C can I just clarify that we're asking if something that is in private session can be heard in private session. We're not debating it in public until we've decided if it's going to be debated in private. So can we then have the debate in private? Do we agree Do we agree or do we not agree? With because the, discussion, the discussions in private will take place in respect, private. With respect, convener, I'm asking a process question. Well, the process in will be the same process as any other item that has ever private, been taken in private. Will it still be we afford the opportunity to members to have that discussion in public about that issue. Have, we, stage. have we ever? That's what done I'm asking. Otherwise. The procedure. Well, that's, in that case, that's, well, that's so, confirmation that we can do that. So, but uh, I don't really understand the point of the question except for trying to get it on the record. Uh, in that case, then, can we agree that we can? Uh, we'll have this meeting in private. Thank you. Uh, is everyone content then that agenda item four will be taken in private? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the next item of business is an evidence session on the attainment and achievement of school-aged children experiencing poverty inquiry. This is the second evidence session on this inquiry, and this week we have a focus on secondary school-aged children. And can I welcome to this meeting Andrea Bradley, Assistant Secretary, Educational Institute of Scotland, Stella Gibson, Chief Executive of the SPARC, Finlay Laverty, Sen Senior Head of Partnerships, Princess Trust Scotland, John Loughton, Chief Executive, Dare to Lead, and Ellen Pryor, Chief Executive, Connect. And should I say to the panel from the outset that if you would like to respond to a question, please indicate to me or the clerks and I will call you to speak. And I'd ask the, for the committee members to do the same. For, those, for the benefit of those watching, I should explain that the committee has just come from an informal meeting with parents, young people, teachers and other professionals on this topic. I thank the panel for bringing along such interesting people to share their experiences with us. And can I also thank all those who attended the session some of those who are in the audience watching this formal session. We heard a lot last week on the cost of the school day uh, and before inviting questions from colleagues, I would like to ask the panel whether access to all aspects of the curriculum should be free to everyone or whether any additional costs should be subsidised or met only for families on low incomes. Would anybody particularly like to respond to that? Andrea? Um, so the EIS um, is absolutely committed to the principle of um, comprehensive education that is free at the point of use for um, all children and young people. So we would be absolutely of the view that all aspects of the curriculum should be open, accessible um, to, to all children and young people, regardless of the socio-economic background from which they come. Ed, is there, I was going to come back, but is there anybody else would like to come? I, I would know. absolutely agree with that. Okay. Can I ask, is, is the issue then that the clarification between what is core and what's not core to uh, some of the costs that were talked about last week where the, the, there, was, there was a claim that some what should be core costs were, being, were having to be met by pupils? Is, is, would you say that's because there's not a clear definition of what those core aspects of the CFE should be? I, I believe it's absolutely clear what is core. Um, and if a young person or their family has been asked to pay for course materials, like uh, photocopied workbooks and so on, that is core. Um, if a young person um, needs materials for a practical class, 
that's core. They can't take part in that curriculum area unless they have those materials. So that's core. Thank you. That's not the sort of example. Uh, there's other types of examples, which are really the type I was talking about. Uh, but I, I completely accept what you're saying. Andrew, did you want to come back? Yeah, I would, I would concur with um, what Eileen has said. Um, you know, um, we, we had examples last week about children's access to home economics lessons. Am I pressing the wrong button? Sorry, it's that your system's different from that. Um, children not having access to, to home economics, or not, not, not having access, but there being a, a cost attached to accessing home economics lessons. We know from members um, feedback to us about um, increasingly cost being attached to children's participation, for example, in art, craft and design, where because of, it's not, it's not so much that there's a lack of clarity about what is core provision and what isn't, it's that um, year on year cuts to, um, to, to school budgets and therefore to departmental budgets have resulted in um, a squeeze being placed on what um, faculty heads and principal teachers are having to manage in terms of purchases of, of practical equipment and so on. And some of these costs um, have found their way to, to families rather than being met by, um, by core funding. So what Eileen has said, we, uh, we would absolutely concur with that all of these things that are essential to children's and young people's participation in day-to-day -day learning have to be met by, by school funds. The problem is at the moment that the levels of school funding are not adequate to provide for all of the practical materials that, that would allow for the richness of experience um, that we want from for our children and young people through Curriculum for Excellence. Yeah, I saw figures last week, I think, that the education spending had gone up by, I think it was 10%. That's not, that's, that's not what, um, what departmental heads and faculty heads are finding in terms of the budgets that they are that they are managing. There have been year-on-year -year decreases in per capita budgets um, uh, and, and it particularly hits uh, practical subjects that do have large expenses to meet in terms of um, paints, for example, in art, or wood for you know for certain um, craft and design lessons, for example. So that's so our members are telling us that that um, who are faculty heads and, and uh, principal teachers who, who have responsibility for managing departmental budgets that year on year on year they're having to make savings in relation to the equipment that they purchase for lessons, but. We also know that in some schools there are charging policies in place to enable kids to, to participate and for us that's, that's unacceptable. Yep, okay, we may come back to that uh, later on. Could I bring in Liz at this point? Thank you, Convener. Uh, could I take you into the uh, extracurricular field because we have evidence and have had uh, this committee over a long period of time that um, extracurricular activity can boost attainment very considerably, particularly amongst some youngsters uh, who perhaps don't have other uh, opportunities. And it seems from the evidence that we have that it's in extracurricular work where some of the uh, cuts are most substantial, whether that's in music tuition, whether that's in sport, whether that's in Duke of Edinburgh going on outdoor education. W would you be able to advise us as to what do you think we can do, particularly in the, in the culture of budget cuts that you've just uh, indicated, Mrs Bradley, what can we do to try and address this extracurricular, um, particularly, as I say, when it raises attainment? So the, the reference that you make there to instrumental music tuition, that's a, you know, a, 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 an issue that's of really grave concern for the EIS at the moment. Um, we know that around two thirds of local authorities have charging policies in place. Um, so there's, a, there's a, an inequity there straight off the bat, um, whereby um, in a third of, sorry, two thirds of our local authorities, there are cost barriers to young people's participation in instrumental music. And we know the emotional, social, cognitive benefits of that kind of, um, that kind of experience. And also the intrinsic, um, enjoyment that comes from simply being able to participate in music, to be able to play a musical instrument. So we are unhappy about the, the, the you know, the fact that there are there are charging re regimes in place, and we think that as a matter of urgency, that has to be looked at in order that all children and young people across Scotland, again regardless of the socio-economic background from which they come, have equal access to that aspect of the curriculum, um, in order that they can garner all the benefits from it that, that so much research um, internationally shows, um, you know are the benefits of it. Can I just pursue you on that point? Because um, you've just quite rightly, in my opinion, uh, mentioned about the core curriculum, as has Mrs Pryor, that, that you know, there are very considerable issues there. And therefore, it's highly unlikely that we're going to find an awful lot of money to sit, you know, make sure that the, the extracurricular dimension is, is funded as well. If that money doesn't come from local authorities, where else might it come from to avoid parents having to pay for it? 
it could possibly come from national government. I think there has to be conversation between national government, local government. If, if, if Scotland as a society places value on music um, as a cultural benefit, then there has to be a, an honest conversation between national and local government about how that's going to be funded and how it's going to be funded equitably. Um, there's also the issue there about whether it's whether that should be a core aspect of the curriculum or whether it should be treated as extracurricular. Um, we are currently of the view that this has to increasingly become part of our core provision um, rather than something that is uh, that is a kind of add-on or, or an optional extra um, you know, to, to families increasingly who can afford it. And we think that there needs to be more done um, to, to scrutinise the benefits of instrumental music, tuition, participation of young people in that, you know, that kind of learning um, and the connection to um, health and well-being, wider achievement and attainment. And if we value it, and there's lots of evidence to suggest that we should value it, then we need to think about how we can meaningfully um, and sustainably fund that for more children and young people in Scotland. Um, just a final question to Mr Laverty and to Mr Lawson. Do, do you believe that uh, in terms of trying to um, Im improve the motivation, the confidence of young people, their ability to engage... Um, and certainly attainment, do you feel that we should be putting more priority on this extracurricular facility? Yeah, I, we, um, our experience um, over, over many years is that there are a, a, a fairly significant group of young people in, in education who perhaps require some alternative. Um, uh, our, our, our methods would be youth work-led methods of engaging with that group of young people. Um, we currently working with 125 schools uh, and about 2,000 young people. Um, so the, the numbers of young people out there who require perhaps that slightly different and alternative approach, uh, which can be done through um, professional youth work, and the voluntary sector does that, I think, quite extensively, or, or by developing the skills and abilities of the existing teaching resource, which we've found to be... Um, a particularly efficient way of doing things. So uh, working with that teacher to develop how they uh, engage with that young person, how they engage with that group um, in a more, um, in a softer way perhaps, but using, understanding the behaviours and dealing with uh, those often quite challenging behaviours uh, in, in a slightly different way, helps them re-engage in education, helps them think about the different choices that they have moving forward. So I think that alternative provision can be extremely useful and I think it can target those groups of, of pupils and young people who are, who are more likely to leave school um, without a positive destination. That's, that's been our partnership work with local authorities and schools for over 15 years now and our experience, I guess. I thank you for the question, first of all. I think, um, to use a very non-jargony piece of language, it's a no-brainer. Um, as the young person uh, who benefited from them services myself, who was the people that caught me, captured my imagination, told me I could be more than the collective sum of the lack of aspiration that everyone had on me because of my postcode and my surname and what my mum and dad did or didn't do as it happened. It was youth work or non-school provision. I don't like saying alternative education because it's education. And, and often it's educating and capturing the imaginations of a cohort of young people who are at greatest risk of negative behaviours for themselves, their families, and go on to perhaps be the custodians of some of the social ills that cost the NHS and our criminal justice system and our social work provision the greatest burdens. Um, a young person who causes trouble, in my view, is a troubled young person. They've been raised like that. And youth work as a sector works with something around, I think it's a bit higher because there's a lot of informality, 400,000 young people per year, that's a huge number. I don't think it has that parity of esteem nationally. I think we still I suppose that as far as possible, young people should stay at school and where that's appropriate, I support that. And I think youth work in schools is really important. The ability to have a relationship with the young people based on respect and not just rules, a top-down power dynamic, an ability to say, we need to support you on your achievement journey as much as your attainment journey to go where that needs to go as opposed to the prescription of an outcome being set at the start of S1. For a lot of young people, it's important because there's the light that Barbara Bush that said, the first teacher you ever have is your mum and dad. The first classroom you have is home. 
and we see such a crossover, as we, of course, we all do, even in this committee, between what happens outside of this room before you turn up for work or put on your uh, student or, or MSP hat, that affects how we feel. We're creatures of emotions. And what Youth Work's able to do is meet young people where they're at and provide a service that fits them, which often helps re-engage in school. I set up a social enterprise in North Edinburgh called the Scran Academy last year. We are taking school refusers, or very heavily non-attenders, um, and they're coming along to the work we do based in the community. We're working with chefs and industry. We're putting them through qualifications. They're getting rehist. They're getting national threes and fours. Um, and they're feeling a sense of achievement for the first time because we respect them and, and work with them. And that's a tale that's common in, in the communities that have the biggest challenges. That was true for me. And I think there's a lot of people working very hard on a shoestring to try and do that for some of the, what we call the hardest to reach young people. But something that's just complicated. Thank you. Julian, you wanted to come in very briefly. Entry question to, to uh, Liz's line of questioning around peripatetic specialist teachers and music's been mentioned and of course PE, whatever, and I come from a rural area. And what, what I've found is that these decisions are often made at local council commi education committee level. And you mentioned there about like uh, central government funding and into education and then, but we have a patchy si situation. So for example, in Aberdeenshire, visiting specialists are being cut by the current administration and in fact were referred to as kicking a ball about by the, the convener of the education committee rather than the, what you've described as it being an enriching and an access for people who wouldn't ordinarily have access to music tuition to get that for free. Is there, is there a case for taking the decisions around um, the spend in terms of, of these extra provisions, which is so important, away from that. You, you asked about central government funding. Effectively, what you're asking for is ring fencing of education spend. That's the position of the EIS in relation to how education should be funded. We would be in favour of the reinstatement of ring-fenced funding to local authorities um, for, for, for education, for the, for the provision of education. So that, that is our, that's our, our, our position on that. And that would extend to all aspects of, of um, what kids experience in terms of their education, you know, whether it be uh, what they get in terms of PE, whether it be their instrumental music um, engagement, you know, that, that it, everything that we parcel up as education, we would want to see the, the funding for it delivered in that way. So um, we have national priorities, but at a local level, if, if, the, if the view is different, then that impacts on those, those kids at that local level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tavish, you wanted to come in briefly. Thank, thank you. I wonder if I could ask uh, John Loughton and Finney Lafferty, um, you both made points about uh, not narrowing the attainment gap, but narrowing the achievement gap. Um, I guess the question for our, for our committee is, in this world of political measurement, uh, because we all get judged on the outcomes if, that, we are, that we do or do not achieve. How do we, and I absolutely take the point about narrowing the achievement gap, how do we best measure that achievement gap and how can we show progress? I think we, we measure what we value, or indeed we try and measure what we think we understand. And there's this phrase called soft skills. I, in my view, in my experience as a youth worker, a practitioner, an NLP coach, they're not soft anymore. We understand the competencies around confidence, communication skills, a positive attitude, what drives attitudes. We can start to measure them. CBI are crying out for that. They talk about, there's not, it's not about a lack of technical prowess or skills that make young people unable to be effective at their jobs or indeed any of us. Sometimes it's turning up with a willingness to work, an attitude of self-belief and confidence to get out there and make that work. And we can start to measure that on a, on a mixture of self-evaluation for the user on that journey, uh, feedback from professionals that, that are wrapped around them and understand it's as much about knowledge and um, uh, aptitudes. Uh, it has to meet alongside confidence and attitude as well. And um, I remember 15 years ago when speaking at myself as somebody who felt like nobody expected anything of me. And, there was a com and I started to live down to that expectation. There was a lack of confidence. And often it's that longer term flexible interventions that can support young people to build a positive relationship. And we say to young people, why do you come to what we run, but you're not going to school? And they say, you understand me, you respect me, you listen to me, you treat me like an adult. And it's, it's not about bad teaching, per se, it's about a different dynamic. And it's through understanding these soft skills, you know, getting the kid to put down his hoodie for the first time and have a conversation with you and look you in the eye, is a big win. And we need to recognize the baby steps that make that, because that's what leads ultimately 
to when you have chief executives or, or leaders sitting around these committees speaking to you and saying, I wasn't the kid that done well at school. Then, you know, there's often a positive adult relationship or a spark of self-belief that through other interventions that, that made that work. And that sits alongside when you have that rapport with a young person whose lives are often a series of biographies of failed adult relationships, often well-meaning, but sometimes ill-placed. You can get away with something more. I know that young people do stuff at what we do because of who we are and how we treat them as much as what we ask them to do. Um, and so value for money around youth work and community learning interventions, I think, offer so much to the public person in terms of hard outcomes by delivering what we still call soft skills. I mean, I think uh, these life skills, soft skills, whatever we want to call them, um, they're really vital and they don't naturally fall out of, of the qualification framework. Uh, we, d we do an annual survey of the kind of well-being of young people. Uh, it's called the Youth Index. And, and this year, the, the kind of the numbers that we got on confidence and motivation and working in teams was at its lowest ebb for eight years. So I think it's interesting, Tavish, in terms of how we put something in place which sets a metric around this. Uh, because unless you measure it, does it happen? I'm not sure it does. Um, clearly, it's very important. All of our corporate partners are saying, yes, yeah, skills are important, academics, OK. But what's really important are values. What's really important to us is the ability to work in a team, you know, the ability to be resilient when you're faced with constant challenges and problems. So we should be listening out there to what those employers have got to say and, and how, how do we address that best as a nation? Uh, perhaps by setting some some metrics for schools and head teachers to follow. Thank you. Uh, Eileen, I'll bring you in the next, but I'm just I'm going to uh, bring in Ruth at this point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, convener, good morning, panel. Um, I'm going to go backwards a little bit. The convener opened with um, costs, and we've heard a weight of evidence about the impact of the cost of a school day. Um, we've spoken specifically there about curriculum materials. I just would like to hear your reflections on the other stuff, and I suppose it speaks to the um, youth work and activity bits of it as well, because even if that's been provided for free, there are barriers getting there, there are other things that, that can get in the way. So um, just your reflections on the impact of that and what work can be done. Um, I suppose, suppose specifically we do have legislation which says education should be free. So what more do we need to do um, in policy terms to make sure that that actually is the case? We went out to parents to ask them their views. And so the cost of the school day was a big issue, the cost of uniforms, the cost of travel. Um, you know, we've, you've heard all of that. That's a massive issue and it's a massive barrier. And for those parents who, whose circumstances have perhaps changed and they find themselves no longer able to afford the school trips, um, and we talked earlier about how we seem to have a competition in schools now to see how exotic we can make our school trips and how inaccessible those are for very many families, you know, it really becomes a massive barrier. So we are restricting the experience of young people. Um, and I, I have a real sense, it's a personal view, that actually when, when we're talking about the attainment gap, actually very often what we're talking about is the experience gap. You know, if young people are not able to experience the activities, the school trips, if their home circumstances are such that they simply can't go away for that weekend or go away on that or go to the orchestra or go to the show or to even in some cases take part in the club, then we're restricting their experience. Um, so that is, a, that is an absolute fundamental. But I think in school, there are many things that can be done because we don't have to have exotic school trips. We don't have to have school uniforms with braiding that changes every year. We don't have to have um, these... these you know, highly individualised uniforms. So, you know, I think that there is, there is a kind of fundamental there about how schools address this issue. Because in every school in Scotland, we have families who are living in poverty. And that is, that's the truth. And it may not be visible, it may not be recognised, but that will be the truth. And it is not just the schemes where families are living in poverty. We, ha we have to address this as a much wider issue, but there are things that schools can do. Um, and and we, we would say also there are things that parent groups in schools can do to support families who are struggling. 
Uh, Andrew. Um, we were talking in the informal session um, earlier just a little bit about um, other countries and how they ensure that, um, you know, when they have uh, rhetoric around commitment to social justice principles, they make sure that, you know, one sort of like part of the, the, the policy framework aligns and articulates well with another part. So while we're talking about how we can mitigate the impact of poverty in education, we also need to look at what happens externally to education because the drivers for poverty lie far beyond the school gates. And the EIS has been saying this for, for well over a decade now because it's been a long standing campaign issue of ours. As you know, we're a trade union as well as a professional association. So as a trade union, we have concern about poverty as it exists in, in society, uh, you know, beyond, beyond you know, the experiences of children. So we need to look at things like the cost of housing. We need to look at taxation. We need to look at social security, earnings, all of these things. And, and we, need to, we, we need to guard against becoming overly fixed on what schools can do, because schools cannot unilaterally um, mitigate the impact of poverty on, on young people's educational um, experiences. That said, Eileen's perfectly correct that there are things that schools can do and, and, and are doing um, and are increasingly having to do in order to accommodate the, you know, the growing financial difficulty that, that many families um, are finding themselves in. So things like um, ensuring that school uniform policy is as universally um, acceptable to families as is possible. You know, so, so things like braiding, things like um, school logoed uh, polo shirts and things like that, these are unnecessary fripperies that cost families um, money, that, that, that bring about stigma for families that are unable to, to afford them. So we need to be talking to uh, local authorities and to our head teachers about uniform policy that is universally um, or, uh, affordable. We need to talk about clothing grants as well because we have a situation that continues in Scotland whereby there's huge variability in terms of the, the clothing grant um, thresholds of entitlement but also the amounts of money that are paid out. So in some local authorities, it's £20. In other local authorities, it's £120. The Poverty Truth Commission has, has, has indicated the average cost of school uniform to be £129.50 per year. So some of those clothing grants are falling far short of just what the minimum requirements are. In terms of um, you know, things like uh, charity and fundraising events, school trips, the EIS has, has issued advice to, to members, I think we did this about two or three years ago, that asked um, basically for all aspects aspects of school po po uh, policy to be equality checked, you know, to be equity checked, and um, to make sure that the number of asks around fundraising weren't too, too great, to make sure that the number of opportunities for children and their families to participate in fundraising drives were diverse, so that it's not always about families bringing in money, um, or the same families being asked to contribute you know, maybe, maybe four or five times in the course of a session, but there are other things that, that, that families, parents, um, other members of, of uh, you know, the, the school community can do in order to contribute to fundraising um, efforts. We also um, issued advice around out-of-school learning, homework. There's, there's cost attached to that as well. We had a, a, a survey recently that, that uh, um, the response to which um, around 45-46% of our members were saying that they saw an increased incidence of children being, being un unable to participate in homework activities that had ICT linked to them because families can't afford broadband or they don't have the hardware that allow kids to, um, you know, that allow kids to participate in that way. So we really need schools, local authorities to be thinking about all of these things and, and shaping their policy around, um, around these issues and making sure that all aspects of school policy ethos um, are, 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 are as included as possible. Ruth? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's, if there's other people wishing to come in. I, I suppose what I would say is that we're, we're very clear that this isn't just about schools. However, as it is the Education Committee, we do hone in on that. And some of the evidence we had um, last week was that actually what happens in the classroom, if we're talking about attainment, um, is the important thing. It's, it's the thing that can help um, the attainment gap. But I'm interested to hear from other people as well. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's a there's a well documented relationship between poverty and, and attainment, and I, mean, I guess as a the Princess Trust as a charity, along with a range of others in the sector, that's what that's what we're trying to support here. I think is really that focus on that five, ten percent of young people who who come from backgrounds that are perhaps disadvantaged, um, and just giving them a different um, a different sight on what's possible and doing that in a way that allows them to think about what they can achieve and actually get there, uh, maybe using a different path and using a different way of engaging with them in the classroom and within the school. And sometimes it's about taking them out of the classroom. Sometimes it's about just giving them an exciting experience, a fun experience, and just changing their whole um, 
their whole thinking around what education is and what it can do for them. But having that focus on on poverty, on disadvantage, I think is what this sector does best. I think it supports that partnership with teachers and with schools to get the most out of um, what those young people are able to achieve because there's amazing talents in there. Um, we, we just need to find a different way a different way of unlocking it. And we have some of the answers, not all of them, but I think we can support this. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Thank you, can I just pick up and... Uh, Sorry, Richard, I not mean to interrupt, but can I just say that we don't need every member of the panel to, to respond. Whoever's got wants to respond, please just indicate. Richard, my apologies. So I'll start off by targeting my question, Andrea Bradley, <laughs> <laughs> in terms of your powerful contribution to one of the previous questions. And, and you say in your briefing note to the, the committee that family income, and I quote, is the most influential factor in children's in-school attainment and wider achievement. Therefore, closing the poverty-related attainment gap requires an honest commitment to addressing the structural inequalities that emerge from policy decisions in those areas that are beyond the locus of the education system but which must equally and fully be aligned to social justice principles. Just to get that on the record. And then you go on to say that 59% of respondents to your own survey indicated they have seen an increase in the number of children attending their schools who are experiencing poverty. So the EIS have clearly carried out a lot of really valuable research into this issue. The rest of your briefing note covers important areas of education and effectively calls for a lot more resources in each of those areas. So is it the case that many factors external to education are causing poverty to rise dramatically, according to your own statistics. And the burden for that is now falling on our classrooms, our teachers, our staff, and of course the education budget. Absolutely. Um, so while we have um, significantly increased incidence of poverty and all of the educational challenges that that brings, we've seen reductions um, to all, you know, many aspects of the, you know, the, the, the resources available to education. So even if we just think about teacher numbers um, and compare, compare what, what our aspirations for our children and young people are and the resourcing that we have with, for, for example, a country like Finland, okay? So, that, so Finland uh, features very well um, in international comparisons around equity and excellence, but they have significantly healthier um, teacher to pupil ratios than we do. So their average class size is around 19. Ours is currently sitting at 23.5, and we know that there's a huge range, um, you know, in, 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 in addition to that, you're sort of like bold statistic. So we have classes of up to 33, even in the broad general education when we're delivering non-practical subjects. So there's something in there about teacher numbers. They've, they've reduced by around 3,500 since 2007. And there's only been some recovery of teacher numbers recently because of the injection of the pupil equity funding, which again, in the informal session, we were talking about being relatively short term. It's not, it's not guaranteed long-term sustainable funding. So there's an issue there. We also talked about additional support needs. We've seen significant cuts in the number of, of teachers who have specialism in additional support needs provision. And uh, we know that there's a huge correlation between socioeconomic, socioeconomic disadvantage and children who have um, additional support needs. So it's while, while we have the legislation in place that is um, that promises a lot for, for, for children and their families, you know, those who have additional support needs, we don't have the resources in place to deliver on, on what that legislation promises and rightly, you know, right rightly does. Um, class sizes, I've talked about you know rising class sizes the the, the the um the 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 benefits of that for kids with additional support needs for kids who have social and emotional difficulties and um, when you want to introduce creative pedagogies that are not so much about rote learning and maybe kind of rigid forms of assessment that allow for much more metacognition collaborative learning learning that is enjoyable for the young people like some of our colleagues here from from partner organizations have described that requires smaller class sizes in order to be able to deliver that that kind of experience day on day on day on day. These are the kinds of investments of resource that are required if we really want to bring about um, outcomes that are much more strongly aligned to you know, um, high quality and uh, e e equitability. The bottom line is the call on resources for education has largely been driven by having to cope with the impact of poverty driven by factors out with the classroom. And do you want to, is there anything you can give about the statistic of 59% of respondents indicated there's been an increase in the number of children attending their schools who are experiencing poverty? What these factors behind that 59% stat statistic is? Are? Yeah, well, that was in terms of, it was in terms of, um, you know, kids' appearance at school, um, kids' uh, 
who, who, who were, who's, who's, where the, where the school policy is that kids should wear uniform, perhaps not being able to sustain wearing of uniform day on day on day, um, kids not being able to participate in school trips, kids not bringing homework, um, kids turning up for PE lessons without the, the requisite kit, um, kids not having uh, materials at home, for example, when they were given bits of what, what could be actually quite nice things to do at school, like make something, you know, make a make a castle or you know even make a card, not having glue and glitter and the kinds of things that, that probably all of our children would have had at home um, and, and readily at their disposal, not having things like that. Um, kids actually coming to school and telling teachers that they were hungry. Um, kids stealing food from one another at times as well. Kids stealing items of equipment from one another. Kids appearing to, to be visibly unwell, you know, um, pale and pallor, um, complaining of headaches, kids having unexplained absences from school. So these were all the, the, the factors that were combining to suggest to our teachers um, that uh, there was increased incidence of poverty and they thought that these things were attributable to, to the, circ you know, the, the, the income circumstances of the families in their school communities. OK, thank you. Can I, before I move on to, to Ross, and uh, I'd like to ask Stella a couple of questions. That the, there was a couple of inc uh, incidents earlier on about the talk of confidence and the, and the stress that's been put on pupils. I wonder if you've got any comment to make about the, you know, the lack of confidence that some pupils seem to have going into the schools and the sort of amount of stress that, that this poverty seems to be leading, leading them into in schools and making it much more difficult for them to achieve that. One of the things I was thinking about earlier on when we were talking in our small group, um, we were talking about parents and their engagement um, with the school, and I was wondering about parents' experiences of school life themselves, and then rolling into becoming a parent themselves, and going maybe back to the, the same school that they, had, that they had attended, and how that then impacts on their children, because they, can't, they, they maybe don't engage well. Um, that was just an aside, because I was thinking about that when we were talking earlier on. Um, we provide um, school counselling in, in um, high schools and primary schools. We do a lot of work, and I know this is about um, senior schools, but we do a lot of work in primary schools as well. And that really is about trying to support children and young people with the difficulties that they are maybe experiencing in their home life, um, where they are maybe experiencing trauma, they are coming in with high levels of anxiety, ag aggression, high levels of stress um, that, that's coming through from their life. And you, you spoke earlier on about we learn from our, 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 our home life. We, everything that we know about relationships, we learn from home. Um, and I think that that's, that's the, the areas that we are, we are supporting in school. We are supporting emotional health and well-being. Um, and if, if children are not ready to learn, no, no amount of other ex, extracurricular activities or um, focus on literacy or none, none of that's going to work if, if that child isn't actually ready to learn. I think that's that's where we are with um, with the services we provide. Are you, uh, are you seeing an upsurge in the, the necessity for your services and what what's driving? If there is an upsurge, what is driving that? We we are now working across eight local authorities. Um, we get um, inquiries about counselling on a weekly basis from new schools. Um, what's driving the upsurge is the ability to be able to put counsellors in schools because they have uh, schools have pay funding to do that. That's driving the requests. That's driving the requests. Um, when we go and speak to um, to head teachers, um, maybe in a group environment, you can actually visibly see them counting or thinking through the number of pupils that they already have who would benefit from counselling. And it's more pupils than, than we'll be able to support in a school year. But they're making the list in their heads as they're talking to us. Do you see, I'm, I'm going to move on to Ross in a second, but do you see uh, the request you see being driven by that? Do you see the need for it being greater than before? Or, or, or are you not in a position to say that because you can only work with what you get? I don't, I don't think I'm in a position to say that because um, the schools weren't in a position to put counselling in place, but if we look at the, um, the waiting list for CAMS, for example, um, there, there obviously is a massive demand for services, but, but that's, that's for the, the, the real high tariff issues. 
There's also a whole raft of other um, children who, who actually would benefit from support. And if we're thinking about early intervention, counselling would be very much early intervention. Um, what we are experiencing, though, is when, when we are, we're, at, we're actually starting in schools, although we, we talk to teachers about, or the head teachers or deputy heads, about trying to mix and match what they're, they're referring to is, they're referring all the high tariff children. And, and what that means is that the counselling is, is much more longer term. We, we try and talk about a six to eight weeks um, a block of counselling. Um, but what we're seeing is we've got, we've got children in counselling for who started in August and who are still in counselling with us. Which then means that the, the real early intervention for the children who are yeah. not at that level is not happening. Yeah. Um, so what we're also seeing that you know finishing our first year with the PEF funding and moving into the next year is we're seeing schools who maybe have one day of counselling are now requesting two. I've got a school where there's four days and they're looking to increase to five days. So now that now that I think that we're we, we, um, we're in schools, um, the schools can see the benefit of the counselling. We provide them with full evaluation, so they've got they've got information that they can then use when they're reporting back for the PEF funding. I, I see that service is only going to grow. Okay, right. Thank you very much, Ross. Mayor, um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the existing or and historical financial assistance that's there. We've already, um, Andrea mentioned, school clothing grants, um, EMA set nationally, uh, free school meal uh, policies. How has has that been working in practice? Because for us to, to understand as a committee how we move forward from where we are now, there needs to be an honest evaluation of what is in place, what has been successful, where have there been issues with uh, uptake, where have there been issues of, of inconsistency between local authorities, what has and has not been successful. So, I mean, just, just to start off with quite a broad question, but what, what are your thoughts on those existing financial assistance packages and the difference or not that they are actually making at present? I would say they're extremely variable. Um, again, one of the questions that we asked parents was about free school meals. Um, and did they know how to claim? Were they helped to claim? And, that, and there's a massive variability, and it's in the paper that I submitted to you. Um, and many of the systems that local authorities are now adopting, which are online systems, are a, are a massive barrier to families. Um, and in fact, we know that some local authorities um, have a, a transaction charge. So if you buy um, your meals for your child on a weekly basis, you will pay four times that transaction charge compared to a parent who's able to pay monthly. So the reason you're buying weekly is because you don't have the money to buy for a month, and yet you're penalised for that fact. Um, and, and simply getting access to these online systems is a massive problem for some parents. So, you know, and, and clearly there are uh, stigma issues and so on around claiming whatever it is, whether it's, it's for school uniforms or meals or whatever. Um, again, we talked about this earlier. Um, you know, the, the nutrition in schools is a massive issue. Um, and, you know, particularly in the secondary sector, we know that most youngsters bail out of school and go down the street and buy rubbish, um, which really prepares them for an afternoon's learning. Um, so, you know, but we also do worry about the quality, and parents tell us that they worry about the quality of what is available in school as well. Um, and again, it's back to that thing about getting the basics right. If we don't feed our children well, if they're not ready to learn because they've had a good night's sleep and they're comfortably clothed appropriately for the weather and, and so on and so on, how can we expect schools to do what they can do? You know, so, so you know, my sense is we really have got to look at the fundamentals and get those right before we start putting sticking plasters and additional stuff in place because... Of course, we're going to have kids who have behavioural issues if they're hyped up on, on Red Bull um, and sausage rolls. You know, what else can we expect? So, you know, we really have to get these things sorted and, and, and proper nutrition um, and supporting families who 99% of whom want the best for their children, but they are living, in some cases, in, under extreme stress and difficulties. So, you know, there, that, that then communicates itself to youngsters and they come into school 
anxious and worried about what, what their home circumstances is. So, you know, we can't wonder, therefore, that kids are unable to, to participate fully in school and to learn. So, there are, to me, there are fundamentals that we have to address before we start thinking about all of the other. I would absolutely echo that in the, in the survey that, um, that I referenced. Our teachers were saying that increasingly kids were coming to school without money for snacks, you know, um, no money for the tuck shop, telling them they were hungry. Teachers are buying food, bringing it to school, feeding kids themselves. Um, so the EIS policy position is universal provision of free school meals. We know that that's been a benefit to, uh, to the P1 to P3s who are, you know, who are accessing that, um, that provision currently. But hunger doesn't know age boundaries, so we would like to see that, you know, that provision extended to all children and young people of school age in order that they can have all the benefits that Eileen's already um, outlined. And just to, to pick up on the, the point that was made um, about issues of, of stigma and issues of a lack of uptake of in, entitlements that, that people aren't entitled to, um, the, the charges you mentioned are in online usage. Uh, the Social Security Committee in Parliament took some evidence around the success in Glasgow City Council uh, with automatic payments, automatic enrolment. Is that something that anyone has any experience of seeing the outcomes of and, and has any thoughts on? No, fine. Um, and Moving on, um, the, it's abundantly clear from, from all the evidence that, that we've received that the point Andrea made earlier about um, poverty starting outside of schools, and if we really want to close the attainment gap, it needs to be tackled outside of schools as well. But for the purposes of, of our uh, work as a committee, looking at how schools can interact with that wider network, um, it was mentioned in the, the small group uh, next door earlier on, um, some schools are using PEF money for uh, homeschool link workers or, or various job titles for those members of staff. How can we use schools and the existing uh, support that is available through schools and the existing staff, um, as well as other resources, to create a more effective link with the wider social security system, with wider social services, um, so that we're actually using the, the school as a, a hub, as a base, um, for that wider support package that we need to actually tackle the, the poverty that children live in, rather than take a sticking plaster approach once they arrive in the classroom? Again, we know from that survey data that some schools are already developing approaches that, um, that mean that either support staff, admin support staff or teachers themselves are helping families to access their entitlements. Um, so that, that's good, that's laudable, but we also know at the same time that local authorities are having to make cuts to the numbers of support staff that they have and increasingly the, the workload burdens for the, the staff who remain you know, with administrative responsibilities is increasing. So we have to do something about that. And while it's good that in some schools teachers are able to provide that um, essential link or that essential support to families in order that they can access their entitlements. We know that the workload of teachers is off the scale at the moment as well, so that requires additional human resource input in order that all families can have that kind of, um, you know, that kind of additional support um, and it's universal across the country and not just where schools have just about managed to provide somebody for an hour a week who can do it. And um, finally, John, would be, uh, oh sorry, Ewan. And to say, you know, and, and schools are, um, in some cases, bringing in family support, and as you say, it's different titles, um, who link um, not just with social security, but, but with youth work and, and link with the third sector locally, so that actually it's about pooling community resources. Because schools sit in their community, you know, they're not islands, they sit in a community, their families live in that community, so um, there is a strong case for that, but my concern is it's short-lived, it's PEF funding. If that's withdrawn, then that role goes. Um, Finlay and John, just briefly, I'd be interested in, in the experience you have um, where you're working with young people who are, who are in education but outside of, of classroom environments, as, as you described, John. Um, what your experience of interactions with the, the social security system, with social services, with local authorities um, is and how, how amenable and how open they are, and if that varies from local authority to local authority, when it comes to working with yourself on issues such as making sure that families receive what, what they're entitled to. That's a huge issues of under, under climbing, huge issues. Sometimes people's lives are so chaotic and fractured that they just don't even, I, I speak about this, I have siblings younger than me who are homeless. They refuse to go into the drug den that we call homeless shelters, and they're in their twenties, same as me, Oh no, I'm 30. Anyway, um, um, similar age as me, and they're just so chaotically removed when it's your own sibling. 
and have the audacity to sit on a parliamentary table and speak when I know I've got two brothers who are dealing with mental health issues that become the more obvious products of my, my mother and father's roots. They're not even claiming benefits. They don't know where to start. GSA. I think there's a, a fundamental dehumanisation that happens with what we call, the, ironically sometimes, the social security system. Whether that's, you know, watching mum get her benefits, family allowance, child support, and that was the structure of the week. And then to the chemist for prescription and back. And now I see it with my brothers, and they're so disengaged. And, and the people that have helped them make steps forward, you know, they went at school from 12 onwards. So I believe, yes, school in theory should be the core hub. But sometimes these people, and I always liken it to living in poverty, is a bit like sitting on a chair that's had three of its legs removed. Every part of you is tense to keep it going. So the slightest move or wind or meander, you're going to go. And you're not going to get into thinking about how do I play with glitter to create, you know, a, a, a nice piece of poetry or how do you, you know, whatever. When you're surviving, how do you think about thriving? Think about culture or creativity. Why are you going to think of yourself in an asset model rather than your deficits that everyone knows you for? So I think there's something about how we inject a sense of humanity and dignity within social security. One simple way, or not simple, but one obvious way for me is, I always see the people receiving services look and sound nothing like often the people running them. And there's a big class and social norms difference, even down to accents and backgrounds. Now, there's a barrier there that we have to overcome. They feel different. And I know I speak about youth work, and I get very annoyed when we use the term school and education interchangeably. It's very, very different. School is one critical hub of education. And I think there's an exciting opportunity for Scotland to take stock of where in reality we are and see that for me sometimes asking teachers who are overworked and stressed and all these other pressures to be able to fight poverty and still financial literacy and budget skills, understand the pressures of mum and dad and, and help you understand your rights post-school around benefits, be able to think about your future career options, overcome your mental health issues, which is probably the largest presenting need I see in my services, chronic self-confidence, lack of confidence, huge issues around anger management. It's a bit like asking the optician to fix your toothache. I think we need to look at there's a, the National Youth Work Strategy of Scotland, we've had two of them. The third one's coming up. I've not been involved in that internal conversation. I would like to hear this committee think about how do we look at holding pressure for a truly innovative National Youth Work Strategy, third time lucky maybe, around saying, how do we truly recognise the myriad and menu of pathways for young people, that bottom 20 percentile, to say that sometimes the classroom for them with rules, focus on attainment around uh, academia, is a bit like them saying they've got too thick and you send them to the optician. How do we recognise what shouldn't be called alternative education, but non-school education pathways, like what many of us run, alongside school for re-engagement, for employability? I think there's an opportunity to recognise youth work, not just as about come and have a custard cream after school or have a game of pool or go and collect your badges. I think there's a real opportunity to recognise truly accredited uh, attainment as well, uh, achievement as well as formal, formal attainment and to really see that one size fails most and I genuinely think I don't see that happening. I see a lot of places we call supportive learning which is ironically very unsupportive and there's not much learning. They're the dark corridors at the top of the school and I say that in the last two weeks of experience and I hate to say this, I, can, I compared it and it broke my heart because one thing when I work with young people, I love them as much as I want to help them and I think that's important because I know that's what I needed at that age. And sometimes they're a bit like, you know when you see a, a cat and dog home, behind the cage, the puppy's desperate to get out. I sometimes see the absolute issues they face, but they're in a very rigid system that can't help them, sometimes exacerbates the problems, and it shouldn't be for them to do. We need to recognise there's a whole coalition of people ready to empower young people in whatever form they come in. We talk about young people as if they're all the same. We know a classroom has a range of different issues. We know a youth work service has a range of different positions. The alternative school down at Spartans, the work of Helm and Dundee, I think we need to recognise through the, the new youth work strategy, the good see ownership and the committee push it to say, let's do something truly innovative where we understand that if school's not working much earlier, we can work with them to effectively signpost young people to get the qualifications or the confidence or the job they need to lead their life. Sorry. Right, OK, thank you. Joanne, you wanted to come in very briefly. Yeah. And can we start to make our answers a bit brief because we've still got a lot to go through and, and uh, we're running out of time. 
I, I mean, that's a very powerful argument for having diversity within our education and, and valuing young people and where they are. But would you agree with me that there are circumstances where the inflexibility of school and presumption and about expectation of young people means we then therefore need services that are not school? Um, and I wonder how, how we hold on to a commitment to compulsory education up to 16 and that we value that and not allow, frankly, some schools simply to say, you're in too hard a box for me, so I'm going to, there must be some provision somewhere else for you. How do you integrate what you've described here very powerfully with an entitlement of young people to have their needs met within the school system? Yeah. Um, I think we have to recognise we don't have universal compulsory education. It doesn't exist. We have lots of young people outside school. They just don't turn up or they get put on a part-time timetable that, that they don't engage with anyway. Um, I think it comes, uh, sorry to be soft with the first answer, is recognising and measuring and truly understanding the impact of non-school education. In a youth club, FETLOR, where we run a kitchen called Scran Academy, social enterprise, they run a business. The answer's shorter, please. Um, we get them qualifications. So I think we can realise that schools alone don't, don't always provide qualifications. Non-school environments can do that. I think um, there's also a big exercise to audit, and this is my last point, Convener, sorry, to understand what makes youth work and non-formal learning approaches that effective. It's relationships, it's other things, it's exciting stuff, out, outward bound stuff, and think, how do we dovetail that into the classroom, but also sometimes recognising the principle that maybe the classroom's not the best place for the young person to be, and I don't know if we have that yet. I accept that completely. No, no, that was a supplementary. Finlay, you want to come in? Yeah. I think a, a point... Um, perhaps answering something that, that Ross asked earlier as well, but I think where it works best, where, where, it, where it's most effective for us, is where, and it's, it's, it's not consistent, it's not universal, it's where you've got, it's got, you've got more of a team approach, and you've got, you know, you've got a group of professionals from the youth work environment who are able to mentor and, I guess, educate the educators a wee bit, um, bring the teachers over into that kind of hybrid space, uh, maybe wrong word there, but giving them the skills that allow them to be youth workers, uh, supported, by, uh, supported by professional youth workers, but done with people support teams uh, help and you create a team uh, that's much more effective and much more rounded. I, I support what John says about there, is, there comes a point when you need to do some of that outside the classroom and it's way more effective if you do that because you get, you get a complete um, uh, burst of, of, of de personal development and soft skills development, which is so much more intensive if you can do that as a group and learn from each other as a group. Very much. Can I come back to you? We're going to move on. jillian has got a question in the same field, so yeah. I'm sure that she'll... Yeah, so fo following on from, from Ross's questions and the very powerful uh, answers there, I want to talk about and ask your opinion on the, the later stages, the senior phase of school, and as uh, young people are preparing to g leave school. And there's a couple of things that were mentioned by some of the MSYPs in, in the, the informal briefing that we had around the cost of moving on from school and the cost of access and what should be opportunities for young people. For example, fees for UCAS, fees for if they have to have remarking of, of their, their exams, um, any kind of barriers with that, maybe accessing interviews, financial barriers, accessing like interviews to get into college or the apprenticeships. Can, can you give me an overview of, of, of where we are with that and if that is, those are real issues? Yes, Andrew. In relation to fees for remarks, those, those fees should be met by local authorities and not by individual families. So that shouldn't be a, you know, that, that shouldn't be a barrier to, um, to families who experience financial difficulty. The, the, the policy is that local authorities um, pick up the tab for any, you know, for any costs incurred by, by remarks. The, the point that you make about access to, to interviews is a good one. Um, I think that employers need to think about that. Um, you know, 
em employers who are conscious of the, the needs of their prospective um, employees will cover the cost of transport to interviews. So there perhaps has to be a, a conversation between um, Scottish Government and employers and representatives of employers about the need for some young people. Well, it should actually be a universal provision, but, but for some young people to struggle to, to meet the cost of travel, that sort of thing, um, and for employers to take responsibility for that. And with regard to the, any fees with actually accessing university education, is that something that you've, you've heard? The, our, our members haven't fed, uh, fed information to us specifically around that, but, but again, um, I, I would consider that that would be a, a, an area of expense that should be covered by the, the local authority. And mo moving on, just the, the EMA, do we think that the EMA is sufficient? I mean, for example, uh, John, you've just been talking about your your area where you're actually given um, qualifications to young people that are actually outside mainstream schooling, but are, do they qualify for, for, for EMA if they're, they're not in school? I mean, I'd It depends. Young people have a different relationship. I think it depends partly on what level of engagement they have with formal education. Some are full-time, some are part-time, some don't go to school at all. I, I don't know the exact criteria cut off for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all we'll Thank us. you very much, Shelley, for your brevity. Uh, Talish. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Commissioner. I just wanted to go back um, to the use of PEF and, and indeed the attainment challenge funding uh, in relation to, I suppose, to changing teaching uh, methods, I suppose, in some ways, questions of the EIS, but also conscious that um, I think, uh, um, Andrew, you mentioned PEF being used for uh, filling teaching posts, so I'd just be grateful if you could give any um, numbers or provide any evidence to the to the extent of that because I think we're all struggling a bit to know how genuinely how PEF is being funded and I think Stella you said you gave examples of how PEF funding was being used in some schools you're dealing with for counselling services so again try to understand what is actually happening with PEF funding and what you make uh, you know what's working and what's not being so successful in terms of tackling poverty given that that's what this inquiry is actually meant to be about. So, like yourselves, um, for the EIS, it's a, it, you know, we've gathered some data around that, but it's a pretty variable picture. Um, so, in some, in some schools, um, staff are being employed and deployed to focus specifically on literacy and numeracy initi initiatives. There are some people who are working on health and wellbeing initiatives. There has been the reinstatement of homeschool link workers, um, you know, to keep that vital connection live between um, what's going on in school, what's going on in the home. Um, there have been initiatives around making sure that every kid in the class gets to go to the theatre um, once in the academic year or gets to go on a residential trip once in the academic year. So, so the picture is very, very variable. So we don't... Yeah, and on the point of the staff, where you, you very yeah. fairly described, have those all been kind of one-year contracts on the basis that the local authority... Yeah, I think it's around 500. I think it's around 500 teachers that have been employed directly uh, through, through PEF funding. So they will be probably one year to two years maximum, um, you know, maximum... Uh, Contracts, yeah, yeah. So short yeah. term, short yeah. term. Short term. Yeah. <coughs> and is that the similar picture with the <coughs> counselling services your organisation's been provided? Yeah, ours, we have been contracted on an annual basis um, for counselling. Um, we're now starting to see um, schools indicating what they want to do next year. One of the interesting challenges for us, though, has been the, um, the whole procurement process. Um, in some local authorities. So some local authorities have been um, quite relaxed in terms of allowing the schools to choose what service they want put in place. Um, and, and that's been fantastic. So the school gets to choose the provider. If it's counselling, they, they might have a choice of providers and it's up to them where, where they go with that. What we've found is though, that some local authorities have said, well, you know, that you can only spend so much, um, you can only provide um, counselling from that, that organisation to so many, to, to uh, an amount of money, um, say £50,000, for example. And if once you've got to the £50,000 mark, then the school has to pick another provider. So even if the school has, I, because, it, 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 because of procurement rules within that local authority, so even if the school has approached us and we've gone and we've agreed with them that we are going to put a counsellor in place, um, that then went back to the local authority and they were told, no, they weren't allowed to do that. It's an incredibly bureaucratic process. Uh, uh, that's some Which costs money. Uh -huh, absolutely. Mm. I think that there's other issues around procurement as well where, um, where the school have said we, we want school counselling in place. Um, procurement don't really know how to, 
to you know, identify who is a good provider of school counselling. Um, and we've seen situations where it's gone through procurement, it's supposed to be a school counselling service, and then we see adverts for that service where the, the, the worker, their workers, not counsellors, they don't even need to be counsellors or have counselling qualifications. But that was a school counselling service that was procured. Mm -hmm. So do you think the principle of giving head teachers the responsibility to use this money in the way, in your case, for counselling is, is appropriate, but it's being held back by rules and regulations set yeah. either in Edinburgh yeah. or in, in a, a local town hall? Yeah, uh, definitely. That's, that's what's happening. Yeah. That, that's, that's definitely an issue for us. Okay. We've come across exactly the same situation. You know, a head teacher who wanted to um, put in a kitchen for so that, that they could be working on nutrition and and a year later still waiting because of procurement. So, you know, it's just... It slows things up. It's mad. Well, things don't happen. Yeah. Absolutely bonkers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's interesting as well because we're now going into year two yeah. and where in the first year... Um, in some areas, they were a wee bit more relaxed about it because they needed to. Well, they needed to spend their PEF money. They needed to get it out the door, and the, the schools wanted counselling. There is this. We, we've been told, well, we're going into procurement next year, so we could be working in a school this year. We could still have children who will be picked up in the new school year. We might not win that contract. Is that Prince's trust experience as well, Finlay? Same battle scars, I think. Um... Uh, and it, coming from um, a position where I think we're in about 125 schools and a historical position of local government um, funding for that work, um, which uh, which followed on from the Concordat, where we, um, eight years ago or ten years ago, we were funded directly by Scottish government. So we're now in the hands of, of, um, of over 300 uh, headmasters, and the procurement exp uh, experience is hugely patchy. Um, and I think one of the unintended consequences of all of this might be that, at least for a transition period, um, some organisations, particularly national organisations, are faced with um, uh, losing ground rather than gaining ground with things that are clearly, uh, clearly working. And does Education Scotland, as the <coughs> principal clango of the government, responsible for pushing out good advice and so on and so forth, do they play a, a role in trying to sort these problems out? No. Who knows? Do. Um, do. I think we've we have with others opened yeah. opened the conversation, um, and I think as always there will be a, a you know a solution here if we're collegiate about. And I think if we can have sensible conversations about how we make what we do more visible to every head teacher, but I think it, you know it is about procurement how we make procurement work efficiently for everyone and not create a bureaucratic nightmare. So the principle is, if you're going to, if the go if government policy is to provide direct funding through the through PEF uh, to head teachers for the range of services that you're offering schools, they've, the, the head teacher absolutely has to be able to make the call and get on with it. There are important checks and balances in the procurement process, yeah. Um, so while, of course, any bureaucracy that's attached to procurement has to be proportionate, it, you know, let's not suggest that we just forget about procurement. We're talking about public money and we're talking about um, sensible, um, you know, well-founded rationale for the spending of public money. And there, there does have to be checks and balances around, for example, the qualifications of the people who are being brought in to deliver particular services for our children and young people. Um, we also want to make sure um, if we're committed to social justice principles that the organisations that are working with schools are paying um, fair, fair uh, wages to their employees and that they have health and safety uh, mechanisms in place and so on. So procurement is important from, for a safeguarding, um, you know, for, from a safeguarding perspective as well. And, and presumably, Andrew, your argument would be that those responsibilities, which we entirely accept, um, is a heavy burden on head teachers who already have far too many heavy burdens to bear. So if those things are all left to head teachers, where do they, when do they get done? Absolutely, yeah. our, our head teachers are very anxious about, um, you know, about additional bureaucracy attached to PEF spending, attainment yeah. challenge spending, and so on. I mean, of course, you know, as colleagues mentioned earlier, they welcome the additional funding to to schools, um, but you know, it does bring hefty additional workload um, for them. Yeah. Okay. One final question I may convene. Very briefly. Uh, just, I, I thought the argument about achievements really important. Do, you, do, do any of the panellists believe there's an argument for some kind of position in schools, which is effectively not a principal teacher of history, but a principal teacher of achievement? Someone who, or, or is that already happening? Is that through pupil support already happening? Do you think there's a better way in which we could do that in our school system? 
I generally don't I, think I'm a naive person, um, but Curriculum for Excellence was supposed to open up the curriculum, provide diverse opportunities and diverse pathways. We've heard from Finlay and John about you know, their approaches. As a parent, that was what I thought Curriculum for Excellence was offering my child at school, in secondary school. So, you know, I think that there is something about the, the, the um, intractability of our education system to actually really embrace curriculum for excellence and to do the things that we, as I say, as a naive parent, thought was part of that package. Um, this isn't, it shouldn't be separate and different. This should be in every school that these opportunities are open. Now, how that's done, you know, a, a, a teacher of opportunity, perhaps, but, you know, we need to see our, particularly our secondary schools, actually look at Curriculum for Excellence and what it offered and do it and not just do what they've always done but call it something else. Uh, Oliver, you've got a supplementary Sorry. and then Mary. Um, I just wanted to ask, just when we were back on uh, PEF on the equity funding, do you think that there's been sufficient support and training to help teachers navigate the bureaucracy both around procurement but uh, also to understand exactly how the money can be used and how it can deliver sort of best value for young people? I think what hasn't happened yet is um, universal experiences of professional learning for teachers around the impact of poverty and what actually makes a difference there. It, it's almost like cart before the horse has happened here. Um, money has been distributed to schools to spend on initiatives that, um, you know, that are supposed to bring about um, reductions in the, the, you know, the, the impact of poverty, but there hasn't been the groundwork done, I would argue, um, to, to best equip schools, head teachers, to be able to make those decisions. We know that Education Scotland is trying to provide some advice around this. There's been some evidence gathered from uh, other parts of the world around the kinds of interventions that might work. There are some academics who think that some of that, um, some of that data is a bit spurious, um, you know, is, is questionable in terms, of its, uh, in terms of its validity. There was a rush to, to provide schools with pupil equity funding, a rush for schools to come up with plans, um, you know, outlining how they were going to spend it. There was a lot of pressure on head teachers round about this time last session to come up with something. So I think that there has been there has been a rush at this. Um, and while of course um, we want there to be additional funding to schools, we're not we're not entirely convinced in the EIS that this was the the, 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 the means by which to, to have done that. Um, and regardless of how the funding is being delivered, you know, whether it's directly to schools or whether it's from uh, local authorities, there has to be um, enhanced and universal professional learning uh, for teachers around the nature, causes and consequences of poverty um, you know, as they manifest themselves in the classroom. And the EIS is going to be working quite closely with Scottish Government in the, the, the coming years around that particular agenda. Stella, you wanted to come. Uh, from our perspective, the, the most successful local authorities in terms of the PEF funding and the ease of, of um, working with schools were, was where a local authority put together a preferred list and options for that for their head teachers. So the so the, the the local authority had actually informally gone through the procurement process. So they had only, they were only recommending um, quality services. And, and that for us was where we saw the, the greatest impact. Thank you. Uh, Mary. Um, convener, I wanted to um, ask about wider achievement and its impact on att attainment. So I suppose my, my question is more directly asked to John and, and Finlay. And I've been particularly struck um, this morning, um, John, about the, um, the evidence you've given us about the personal interventions that you had and the benefit that they had for you and the work that your organisation um, does to help and encourage young people. Because we know that education is not just about what goes on in, in the school. Learning is not just about school. It's about lots and lots of different things. And similarly, I was struck by some of the evidence that the Prince's Trust has given us about the work that it does in, in schools. And if we accept that all of the um, additional support and, and ad additional um, education that young people get has an impact and a benefit on, on their attainment, I suppose the question I really want to ask you is, what can be done at national and local level then to make sure that that is um, fully delivered and young people are allowed to take full advantage of all of those things. Who would like to go first? Big question. 
I think it probably chimes a bit with Tavish's question about the, the role of broader uh, achievement alongside attainment. Sometimes they're the same thing. You can recognise great achievement within attainment. It's not always different. And I don't know, it's just something I was thinking about. I was sitting there thinking, what's the purpose of attainment and achievement? It sounds obvious, but that recognition of self-development, personal social growth in one form or the other. Um, I don't know if I'd go as far as I'm thought about, but having kind of a, a principal teacher of, of achievement, if you like, um, I think there's other ways of doing that. Ultimately, the custodian in a school of, of achievement should also be the head teacher, alongside attainment. Um, I asked one of the head teachers we work with ahead of coming here, um, you know, is there anything they would want to directly say? And they said the bespoke curriculum, creative partnerships and recognising what we're good at and how we need to work with others is what makes us have achievement and attainment at the heart of um, education for our young people. I think there's an opportunity, I mean, I've always had an eye, a thought for a long time, Mary, about p having a good quality community or youth worker in every school. So, you know, you want a mixture of in and with schools in terms of the youth work, broader, non-rules-based pedagogies are in, an ability to be more innovative and try things out, smaller, intense, one-to-one -one mentoring um, uh, opportunities that like Princess Trust does so well, and I know Finn will, Finn will reference um, uh, on that as well. So and I think there's an opportunity, and I know I mentioned it with this new national youth work strategy, to, to really be creative with how government works with the sector to recognise nationally putting in place the helpful pedestals in which we as local service providers can hook to and, and engage with and recognise that parity of esteem for non-school education actors in delivering that. Would you be confident enough if that, if that was done at national level that it would filter down sufficiently to local level to ensure it was delivered at local level? You always have to be confident, the alternatives uh, not what we're thinking about in a sense. Um, if it's done in an intelligent and secure and smart way, if it's multi-year, if there's some funding alongside it to enable the sector and understanding with research what, what metrics and measurements work. Uh, because just because we sound good as a youth work sector, the challenge is to us too. We need to understand uh, scale. We need to understand when we don't work. We need to understand how to make sure we're, we're compliant and, and, and ethical and capable um, uh, in the same way that we would, would ask that of others. So um, I think if it's innovative and, and it's supported financially, I think there's a real opportunity if the sector owns it. Of course, the financing is the key to it, I would yeah. imagine. Yeah. Okay. Finley. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, um, I mean, if we're listening to what employers are telling us, they're saying that these skills, these life skills, soft skills, values, are actually really important to us. Um, currently, we don't have a metric, or I'm, I'm not aware of a metric, which is looking at how well or otherwise schools are delivering these soft skills. And as organisations, we'll look at stuff like confidence, working with others, setting and achieving goals, managing feelings, reliability, attendance. We'll look at those things. You know, we'll measure them. These are the, these are the steps that young people who will be successful for us will take. Um, and I, I think... Um, I think the idea that we have some form of metric that helps us um, understand how we're doing as a nation in terms of developing these soft skills and developing these life skills, I think could be incredibly useful in terms of how we develop our workforce for the future because it builds a resilience into that workforce. It, it builds in the kind of attributes that business is looking for. And we can graft on the skills. We can, we can graft on the academic. They're very important, obviously. But without the core, without the basic building blocks and that spine, um, you know, you're, you're working from a position of, of disadvantage. So I think there's something we could do differently here. It could be quite significant. Did you come in, Mary? Some, some kind of matrix that would show achievement and skill in all its forms? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. I think we need to be clever about how we do it. But yeah. Andrew. Okay. Yeah, can I just say that the Curriculum for Excellence experiences and outcomes have these soft skills embedded in them and teachers are assessing these things all the time. Now, we've talked about measures um, and I think that we need to be careful that we're not looking all the time for quantitative measures. Teachers make qualitative judgments every single day, you know, every single half hour about how individual children are doing around these soft skill areas. And OK, these, these are not easily countable judgments, you know, they're not easily, easily shorthanded, but teachers um, either in verbal feedback to kids or through 
through uh, discussions with parents or in written profiles, which is really intrinsic to, to good formative assessment. Teachers are making these kind of judgments all the time and helping kids to determine what the next steps in their learning should be, not only in terms of like, you know, what they need to learn in, in maths or what's the next thing that they need to do to be able to join sentences together in a paragraph for English, but like what they need to do to build their confidence in accessing all aspects of the curriculum. So let's not let's not like you know um, conduct this discussion to sit in a way that suggests that schools and teachers are not already doing these things. They are, but they don't. It, this doesn't lend itself easily to um, simple quantitative measurement, and that's not a bad thing. Right. So if it doesn't lend itself easily, how do we how do we enable it to do that? To to, to come up with simple uh -huh. quantitative uh -huh. measures. Do we want that? Do we want to reduce? Um, well, you know, well, when you say it doesn't lend itself easily to measuring, measuring all of that, is there something else that you think should be done? Is there some other measure that should be taken? to allow teachers to, to make those assessments? I think teachers are doing that. Teachers are doing that every day, but they're doing it in words. Um, so they're, they're, they're telling kids um, how confident... Like I was an English teacher, right? So I would talk mm -hmm. about kids and maybe if they were having to do something like a, a, a presentation to the class, I would talk about their confidence, maybe from doing it from mm -hmm. the last time to this time, and their confidence would, would, would manifest itself in terms of tone of voice, ability to look at the audience, using gesture, facial expression, things like that. So you would be... You would be making comments about their confidence but but in a way that, that articulated it for the kids so that they could visualize it um, and teachers are doing these kind of things relative to their own subjects all the time talking about confidence talking about the levels of contribution that kids make giving them the little the little steps that they need to take showing them the little steps that they need to take in order to you know to just move their confidence mm. confidence on from one learning activity to another so teachers are doing these things but it's not a number out of 10 and it's not a grade from a to d um, it's words that teachers are using to coach kids it's basically it's a coaching approach um, and, and encouraging the skills of metacognition so that kids can understand what it is that they are doing when they're you know when they're when they're taking part in a particular learning activity the skills that they're demonstrating that the level of skill that they have and what they need to do to move to the next the next level if you like or to, to strengthen okay. or solidify those skills but this is all done in words it's done in conversation and um, sometimes written down in words but it's not numbers and it shouldn't be numbers because we know from lots of research evidence that simply providing kids with a number out of 10 or a grade from a to d mm. doesn't encourage their future learning it doesn't okay. encourage it thank you okay, thank you george Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, I've been particularly, uh, it's been quite good to hear from John and Finlay, because we all know, I think John will agree with me this, I'm a great believer in beyond the, the school gates is the real world that many of the young people that we actually are talking about live and how we engage with them and their families is the way forward. And I, Is it not the case that we need to look at different ways of doing it? I, I'll talk about an example that I spoke with. Uh, Fergusley Park in my constituency in Paisley's might be one of the areas of dep biggest deprivation in Scotland. And the local professional football clubs that the FC are based in it as well. And they do a lot of work in the community in order to do things like that. But the former chair, Stuart Gilmer, actually said to local authority and third sector partners at one point, when are you going to second some staff into the club to actually do some of the work? Now, I know you mentioned Spartans School, I think it was, and I think I know what that is, uh, you know, but is that not the way we should be looking forward with a lot of these young men and women to be able to engage with them to actually, as you quite rightly say, John, they're not going to school anyway. You know, so we need to find a way to get them these qualifications and find a way that design it in a way that will work for them. Yeah, I think that somebody who works at the coalface but also has worked kind of more macro within policy and national policy and when I run the youth parliament and stuff, chaired it, sorry. You can, you can um, connect yourself to the aspiration of policy or you can work as you see it. And there's sometimes a, just a disjointment there. Uh, Spartans is a community uh, football club, but it's much more than that and they, they run a a school provision or education provision out with the school, but with the school for, for non-attenders, just to, to, an, to answer that point. Um, I always find it weird saying youth workers, because we talk about like a certain cohort as a profession, but in many ways, we're all youth workers in a sense, we're all people who work with young people. So you can cut it that way as well as that way into, into sectors, and teachers are youth workers, we work with young people, they're not kind of some just exam-based different organisations. I think that's really important. It's powerfully made. Um, in terms of how we recognise without hard metrics, I think one thing is recognition. There's a whole range of non-SCQF awards out there. Duke of Edinburgh Awards, perhaps be one of the more obvious. John Muir Award, Youth Achievement Awards, that recognise and capture achievement as well as attainment. That's really important. I think DAV is the second most cited 
UCAS entry after work experience for young people. So we are in some ways capturing achievement um, in that sense. The other thing that's really important, I'm surprised it's not come up, is to, to ask the young people themselves. Mm -hmm. I remember I was 13, I think I was, and I was dragged out of Muir House and to give a deputation to the City of Edinburgh Council. I remember standing there and I was speaking about methadone and needles in my stare and pretty hard edged stuff, which for me was normal. Mm -hmm. But I remember saying a sentence, young people are the experts on young people and we know our feelings more than anyone. And I hope it doesn't come across as mushy, but sometimes that role of empowering young people to self-evaluate rather than be coached or observed or told, and this accounts for all industries, I think is something we're, we're at risk of overseeing. And actually, I've never seen young people given space and they haven't filled it and blown them out of the water. And I know so often with your political engagements, it's young people that really capture the tone of things and really bring it to heart to what it's worth. So I think in terms of looking at wider achievement and perception of how you're doing and achieving alongside feedback, there's a big element about young people's voices themselves. Young people experiencing poverty are the experts on that, even if they don't realise it. I, I, and uh, just picking up on John's point, uh, you know, I think teachers, uh, there was one of the teachers uh, at the informal session that we had earlier, and they, the point she made about the main difference between working with our sector was that young people got to choose what they did. Um, and I think, again, picking up on Andrea's point, you know, teachers aren't just about academic. They are very much interested in, in how they can engage young people in activity that's inspiring them. So uh, your point, I think, George, was around football. I think there's a number of different things that will inspire young people. It could be the arts, it could be dance, it could be music. We work really closely with Albion Rovers, Rangers, uh, Celtic, to give young people a, just a different, more inspiring setting to maybe... Uh, consider different things and consider learning. But the thing though, it, for uh, it's a terrible term that we all use, hard to reach families and young people, is it not just the fact that you're playing in their space? You know, something they want to do. Yeah. The perfect example I use is that one did a cooking course for fathers in the local area and they went to corporate hospitality and done it. They wouldn't have gone to the local centre and done it, but they did it because it was Sitman FC. Yeah. You know, and uh, and mum and dad sat down, had a meal with the kids and everything else. And it's things like that that we're talking about soft skills that people uh, or families are forgetting about as well. And it's trying to find a way to just make that connection, which no matter what a, lo a school or a local authority or MD does, they're always seen as the authority, as opposed to someone going to put a Sitman yeah. polo shirt on. Yeah. You know, it's... Yeah, I think that having those different points of reference, I was, I was born in Figures the Park, yeah, almost a hundred yards from the stadium. But I mean, having that point of reference for young people, oh. which is entirely different from the school and the institution, particularly for the groups that, I guess, we engage with, who, who have tended to disconnect or, or not engage in education, it's important that you get that lift and that you get that inspiration, and you find a way of connecting with. Uh, what turns them on? Yeah. It just shows you, Finlay, us, us Fiji boys get everywhere. We get everywhere. <laughs> you can't keep us doing, George. That's the thing. Uh, Can I thank George for a record amount of mentions of St Mirren? And, uh, <laughs> Did he the mention we won quest. the championship? And I, I absolutely appreciate the St Mirren mentions as well. <laughs> You're not getting invited back. Uh, <laughs> go on. Yeah, um, there's, there's so many different things here, but I suppose my presumption is that. Um, young people who live in poverty are disadvantaged. It makes it more difficult to engage with education and there are things external to school. I mean, I can, uh, that makes sense to me. Things external to school are huge determinants. I would say that some young people may be living in poverty, but they don't live in chaotic families. And the danger that we conflate the two, and it's simply the fact of the lack of income and there are very basic things we can do about that. However, I don't know if you saw the evidence from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, um, which presented us last week, and they made the point that there is evidence that young people from disadvantaged backgrounds are achieving better in some places than they are in other. So it's not just about external factors, there's something happening in schools and within local authorities that are compounding disadvantage. Because I agree schools are not on their own or education on its own. Um, they're neither the causes or you know, the complications of poverty, but they, they have got the opportunity to mitigate it and some are doing it better than others, it would be the argument from that uh, evidence. And I wonder what you, say from the point of view of the EIS and perhaps from the others as well, what is your explanation of that um, evidence and what can we do about it? Because 
you know, there is a false characterisation, I think, which says um, education doesn't take responsibility for any of this, and it's always somebody else's fault. And I don't agree with that, but the, you could put a spin in that evidence, which suggests actually it is about the quality of teaching, is what, what's happening in individual schools and individual local authorities. Andrea, I think it's about you. a number of things, um, John. I think it's about quality of teaching. I think it's about policy responses to the school community that you're that you're working in. Um, I think it's about resources. Um, from my own experience as a teacher, I taught um, for the biggest part of my career, 15 years or so, in an area of high deprivation. And I taught in a department that was absolutely committed to social justice principles. We taught children um, in mixed ability classes until the curriculum demanded otherwise. So when they only, only at the end of fourth year, were they, were they then kind of set, if you like, according to attainment, you know, in order to access hires and intermediates and, 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 and so on. Um, we took very good great care to construct our classes or configure our classes along mixed ability lines. So there was um, a gender balance, there was balance in, ter in terms of kids' attendance, there was balance in terms of additional support needs requirements, um, there were mixed ability groupings within the, within the classroom as well. And what we found over time was that the achievement and attainment of the young people in the, the department that I worked in compared very favourably to, to that um, or, or of the, to, to that of, um, the kids had in other departments in the school, but also across the local authority. But that was down to uh, that was down to a core of us individuals who were prepared to negotiate and argue for um, additional resourcing. So we had smaller class sizes for a time to accommodate that mixed ability approach. We had cooperative teaching for a time to accommodate that mixed ability approach. And there were a core of us who worked with that way for you know, well over a decade. And it meant that when cuts began to be made and class sizes began to creep up and, you know, a year on year, the, the additional uh, teaching support that went into those classes dis diminished, we had, a, we had a skill, we had, we had a, a repertoire of skills that enabled us to keep that going, right? Um, and still, the, still the, the outcomes for those children, just in terms of their experience and achievement and attainment in English, was, was favourable. Um, that kind of thing needs to be scaled up across the country. It needs to, we need to be talking about things like that. And that's why I talked earlier about professional learning and the importance of teachers having professional learning around nature causes consequences of poverty and also the kinds of interventions that, that, that research shows make a difference for kids who are, who are disadvantaged. So mixed ability approaches, formative assessment approaches, um, class sizes that, that, that allow for the kind of creativity and enjoyment of the experience that has already been outlined by colleagues here. These are all the, the factors which are expensive, they are expensive, but these are the factors which we know and which lots of international uh, evidence points to as being the, you know, the, the, the things that really will turn around um, the, the, you know, the, the kind of equity um, uh, record of Scotland in relation to children's um, so attainment and just achievement. Just to be clear, the EIS therefore does accept that the kids living in poverty in one part of Scotland fare better than others, and your explanation for that is around what happens in the classroom? Well, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's around what happens in the classroom. It's around, it, it's around resourcing. It's around the resource interventions that are made. In... Uh -huh. I'm, with it, I'm, not, um, I'm not making myself clear, I don't think. Is the cause of the difference between a child who's living in poverty in a school as opposed to the other school because this school doesn't have as good quality teaching? There, no, 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 that's not what I said. There will be better, there will be better outcomes for children and living in poverty and more consistently better outcomes for children living in poverty where conscious policy and resource decisions have been taken to mitigate the impact of poverty. Trying to establish it's whether the IS accepts the Joseph Roundtree Foundation's findings, which suggest that children with the broadly similar experiences will do better in some places rather than others. Do you accept that? And if you do, would you be looking to try and understand why it's better in one area than another? I, I completely accept your, issue, your argument about resources in, this, in general and about the whole school approach. It's all about sports staff as well as teaching in the classroom. I accept all of that. But are, are you looking at, are there other things happening in the system, which means that a, a child who's disadvantaged in one area is doing better than a disadvantaged child in another? 
I think I think that uh, I've outlined that there are variables across across local authorities. Um, so even the things that we've talked about so far in terms of instrumental music tuition, um, some local authorities don't allow charging for home economics, for example. There are different policies around school uniform from school to school, never mind local authority to local authority. So there's huge variability in terms of what goes on at school level. So it's very difficult to say um, the outcomes that the outcomes that are uh, you know that are particular to this locale are because of this factor, this factor, this. You know, there are so many variables there, and the EIS doesn't have that kind of micro data that would enable us to, to arrive at those kinds of conclusions. What we do know from research and what we do know from what our members tell us and what we do know from our own personal experience is that when you have the correct resource interventions to support sound policy rationale, that leads to better outcomes for children living in poverty. OK. Um, I suppose, can I then ask your view on... The, what, is the EIS suggestion that that kind of approach is defined at a national level and expected to be delivered at a local level? Or what are the consequences of a policy which is driving the decision down to a school level, where presumably the variables would become even greater? Which is your preference? Because you describe a very interesting model that you would engage with at a school level, indeed at a departmental level. Should it be the case that our education system should be directing these things at a national level? or at a local government level, or how do we iron out these difficulties and what are the consequences of pushing it down onto schools? I think that there has to be there has to be a, a national conversation. I think about about that and, and about how we organise the delivery of education. Again, I'll talk about Finland. Finland delivers its education um, to children in mixed ability classes, so they're taught in mixed ability classes from when they start school until when they leave school. They set their, their formal exit qualifications at the end of that process. Children with additional support needs are um, are taught in mainstream classes, but they're given adequate adequate support in order that they can access um, and succeed. Um, you know, access the curriculum and succeed um, according to you know according to their particular interests and abilities. So I think that we need to look at adopting a similar approach to that. I'm talking about. I've talked about that from my. Um, personal experience. I, I came to that school, they had been doing that in that department for a long time before I came there and they had sustained um, sustained positive outcomes for children who were in that who were in that category. Poverty wasn't a new thing uh, in the area that I taught in. You know, the, the, it's been a long-standing issue in that part of the country. Um, but but that, that school or that department judged very quickly, very early on, that there were going to have to be different approaches to, to um, teaching those children our particular subject um, than had been traditionally, um, you know, the, the case in that school, and and a lot of thought, a lot of collaboration, a lot of professional discussion, and as I say, additional staffing resource went into making that happen. We worked very, very closely with the additional support needs department. We worked closely with educational psychologists and other um, external providers of support, and that was what led to the success um, in terms of outcomes for those young people. And some colleagues, you know, some of, some of the colleagues have mentioned earlier about um, you know, young people who don't engage with education. In the 20 years that I taught, the biggest majority of those years in that school, there were very, very few children and young people that I came across who didn't want to engage with education because when you put those kinds of supports in and when you make the experience enjoyable and when you show them the achievements that they're making day to day and when you've got enough staff to talk to them and to nurture them and to build positive relationships with them, then their school experience is a much more positive one and it leads to better outcomes. But we can't get away from the fact that that's about resource and it's about resource in terms of quality of ITE provision, it's about ongoing professional learning and then it's about teachers and other um, specialists on the ground, day to day to day, to support um, the, the provision of quality education um, for, all, for, for all of our children and young people. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, we also can't get away from the fact that uh, the Finnish education system isn't just about the Finnish education system. It's about, we, we're just back from there, as you'll know, uh, it's about the way they approach a lot of other things. So it's hard to take it in isolation and just say that's what we should do with the Scottish yes. model, much as I am yes. a huge fan yes. of what they're doing yes. in Finland. But we, but we have aspirations to be world leading, to be the best place in the world for our children to grow up, but that's not going to happen unless we start to you know, look we at should, the... We should always take best practice and, yeah, and, and exactly. put it in the Scottish context exactly. as much as yeah. we possibly can. Exactly. OK, can I uh, thank you all for that, uh, for attending today. It brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting. We will now move into private sessions, so thank you very much.
in the gallery to leave before continuing.